Greetings from the Nanovec Institute for European Studies here at the University of Notre Dame. My name is Clement Sedmak, and I serve as director of this institute, which has been established to build bridges between our university and Europe. Welcome to our virtual panel, Fires and Floods, Europe 2021. We have all seen the shocking images of flooded cities in Europe this summer. Since mid-July, several European countries have been affected by floods. Some were catastrophic, causing deaths and widespread damage. The floods started in the United Kingdom and were followed by floods in Austria, Belgium, Croatia, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. More than 200 people died. Belgian Minister of Home Affairs, Annelies Verlinden, described the events as one of the greatest natural disasters our country has ever known. In the same summer of 2021, we have seen wildfires burning across Southern Europe. We have seen a disturbing footage of burning woods in Greece, Italy, Turkey, and Cyprus. Hundreds of fires, hundreds of thousands of hectares lost. In Greece, firefighters had to battle what the prime minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, described as the country's greatest ecological disaster in decades. Scientists identified climate change as a major driver of these calamities. In the same summer, in August 2021, last month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a landmark report that talks about the future of our planet. We want to get a better understanding of the situation we are in and would also like to identify action points, steps that can be taken, steps that we can take. Our panel this early afternoon will discuss the situation in Europe and the implications of the IPCC report. We have four distinguished panelists, and I'm so grateful to each one of them for taking the time and sharing their expertise and experience, their concerns and commitments. May I please introduce our panel in the order of their speaking slots. Daphne Tollis is a well-known freelance producer, journalist, and documentary filmmaker from Greece. She covered the fires in Greece in summer 2021. Welcome, Daphne. Thank you for being here. Diana Ulge Forsatz is professor in the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy at the Central European University in Budapest and Vienna. She's also vice chair of Working Group 3, Mitigation, in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and a co-author of the IPCC report. Welcome, Diana, thank you for being with us. Deborah Chavlin is Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Notre Dame and a faculty fellow of the Nanovic Institute. Thank you so much, Deborah, for being with us this afternoon. And Anne Falkenhut is a researcher in the Faculty of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands she works on questions on the motivation for behavioral adaptations. Thank you, Anne, for being with us as well. Welcome to you all, dear panelists. Each panelist will offer her or his insights for about five to seven minutes, and then we will have time for some questions and comments. We will end on time after one hour, since we want to respect people's schedules, and since we know that our European colleagues have already moved into their Wednesday evening. So again, welcome all. I just received the message that Daphne is probably not yet online. Um, if this is the case, I don't see Daphne either. That's correct. Yes. Then uh, I would ask Diana if you're kind enough to start us off as our first panelist. And we hope that Daphne will join us momentarily. Diana, over to you and thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation once again. And uh, I want to offer a couple of uh, key insights from the IPCC report that you have just mentioned. So I will show just a few slides. Yes, so let me just offer you a couple of insights from uh, the physical science basis of climate change, the report which has just been released. So by now it is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts more frequent and severe. 
Within that, we know now that human influence is now the main driver of hot extremes, which have become more frequent and more intense and often lasting longer. Ocean warming since the 1970s, as well as ocean acidification. Changes we see in the frozen areas of the planet. For example, the global retreat of glaciers since the 1990s. 40% decrease in the Arctic sea ice area since 1979, which translates into close to three quarters of uh, mass loss of the Arctic sea ice. And this is um, um, probably driving many uh, weather events also in Europe, although this uh, has been still not established fully by uh, the scientific community. The decrease in spring snow cover since the 1950s. So climate change is already affecting every region on earth in multiple ways. And the changes we experience will increase with further warming. So um, within that, extreme heat is made more frequent, more intense, and potentially even lasting longer. Heavy rainfall, more frequent and more intense. Drought increase in some regions, including, I will show among that, the Mediterranean region. Fire weather, more frequent. Ocean warming and acidifying and losing oxygen. Out of these five identified here, three of these have definitely occurred very severely over the summer um, in Europe. And let me offer just one particular example of the magnitude of how much these extremes are expected uh, to be intensifying. This is uh, hot temperature extremes over land. Imagine the 50 year event, which means the hot extreme that we had so far only twice a century. Under a four degree warming, this is going to be uh, 40 times more likely. And four degree warming, we could easily have already in the second half of the century. That means that instead of occurring twice a century, that heat extreme, hot extreme will occur 80 times in a century, so almost every year. And there, each of these is going to be made 5.3 cent degrees centigrade hotter. Uh, also, soil moisture and um, precipitation is affecting especially um, severely Europe. If you look at these pictures, one and a half degrees, two degrees, and four degrees global warming. If you see over land, particularly one area is that the biggest loser in terms of uh, precipitation, and that's definitely the Mediterranean. No other land area on the earth is going to lose that much precipitation as the Mediterranean. And if you look at even between one and a half degrees and two degrees change, the Mediterranean is going to have a major increase even between just uh, these two climate thresholds. So even with half a degree, the Mediterranean will lose significantly more um, precipitation. And in general, the water cycle is intensifying because with warmer temperature, the atmosphere can hold more water. That means, and um, there is more and faster evaporation because of the have more heat. Uh, and as a result, there is heavier precipitation. So, but above the heavier rainfall, we also do see and will see uh, as a result of the intensified water cycle, intensifying dry seasons and droughts. So uh, these are just a couple of the examples, and I hope I raise your interest and you're going to join uh, me in exploring further um, the actual report. There is also Climate Atlas on, online where you can look at these different temperature thresholds, what it will mean for your particular area or within uh, the particular area of Europe, and uh, these are some of the contexts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, chairperson of the working group and co-author. Let us move on and ask Deborah Chavelin, our uh, political scientist here on the panel, uh, to follow us as the second panelist. We still hope that Daphne will join us. She is, she would join us from Greece. Maybe there were some fragilities over with the Wi-Fi. So Deborah, we are very glad that you are here from South Bend. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be on this panel and, and grateful to the other participants for sharing their expertise. I myself am not an expert on Europe or even on fires and floods. I study adaptation to climate change, which is generally about reducing human vulnerability to climate change. 
So as the temperature increases and brings impacts like fires and floods, what are we humans doing to protect ourselves? And not just in a reactive way, but in a proactive way, anticipating the impacts, maximizing the chance that people will not only survive, but be able to thrive as individuals and communities. A lot of scholars and practitioners in the adaptation community will say things like, all adaptation is local. And what they mean by that is that the impacts of climate change vary from one locale to the next. So communities that are bracing for more floods might need to adapt differently than communities that are bracing for more fires, uh, or in the case of communities that I study here in the United States, more hurricanes. Um, and really in all of these cases, it's not just that they are bracing for more in the sense of more frequent, but more intense or longer lasting hurricanes, floods uh, and fires, or covering more territory. But the problem with the idea that all ad adaptation is local is that climate change is planetary in scale. So true, a fire makes its force known differently than a flood or a hurricane. But the bigger point is that humans everywhere in the world are feeling some impacts from climate change and humans everywhere in the world need to adapt. And adaptations in one community necessarily affect adaptations in other communities either because resources are scarce and we are making decisions about which people and property to save, um, or because an adaptation to reduce vulnerability in one community might inadvertently increase vulnerability in another community. Um, for example, we build barriers to floods that move the water away from some properties only to flood others, and we just change who suffers. Um, and the bigger point that I want to make in this panel is we are failing at adaptation. So there's so much talk in the media about humanity's failure to mitigate, to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. We need an equivalent discussion about humanity's equivalent failure to adapt. Um, so I can't speak in uh, detail about plans of the European Union to adapt. Um, and I'm sure if we had representatives of the European Union on this panel, they would speak eloquently of the new EU strategy on adaptation to climate change. It was released a few months ago, February, 2021, no doubt this is a great thing, so I don't want to diminish the importance of these efforts. At the same time, when I read the description of the EU strategy, it reads like something that could have and should have been written several decades ago, or at least years ago. It is a plan when we should now be full swing in implementation or even past implementation. We should already be ready. Climate change is now and we are not ready. Um, yes, there might be isolated adaptation success stories, especially in the rich nations of Europe. And again, I don't mean to discount these individual efforts, but um, there's something called publication bias in the social sciences that drives social scientists to report uh, only statistically significant findings. Um, and publication bias in the social sciences, um, I worry, also drives social scientists to focus on the adaptation success stories or the efforts to adapt, the planning to adapt, right? Because these are just they're things we can talk about, things that seem like they're being done or at least uh, thought of. We don't spend enough time on the big picture story, which is that we are not ready. We are not prepared for the impacts of climate change. What we just saw in July and August of 2021, that is our new normal. That is the beginning. And those events occurred in some of the best resourced nations in the world. And even these best resourced nations are unprepared. We've known that this was coming for quite some time. Um, and I failed to see some global approach, some action at the planetary scale that suggests that people will be okay. Um, you might ask, well, what exactly should nations be doing to adapt, especially the nations of Europe? Uh, you might say, well, even if we know that heat waves, fires, floods, mudslides, and other disasters are the new normal, it's not like we can anticipate the location of each one and then preempt it. And that's true. The only way to prevent or minimize the impacts of climate change in Europe and everywhere else is to mitigate, to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. In terms of adaptation, what we can do is anticipate the aggregate impacts and imagine how they will play out demographically. So the extreme weather events, in addition to the slow onset events like drought and water scarcity, are making many places uninhabitable. Uh, people will have to leave their homes and communities in search of basic human needs, water and shelter, not to mention new livelihoods. Um, this is already happening here in the United States with each hurricane, just a few more people don't return home. Where will they go? 
Where should they go? In, in Europe, current migration trends will seem like nothing. Europe and the United States and places like Russia will be migrant destinations on a scale never before seen. What is Europe doing to prepare for these demographic shifts? It seems to me very little, which is the same answer I would give, by the way, for the United States. Uh, we are winging it. We're reacting to each new disaster. And if anything, we're committing to rebuilding in hazardous locations. We're using scarce resources for the short-term gratification of restoring places simply because we have sentimental attachments um, instead of doing what we need to be doing, which is engaging difficult, critical questions of where it would be safer to move people for the long-term. So we need long-term planetary thinking, not just for mitigation, but also for adaptation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. So uh, to give you an update, we are trying to reach Daphne Tollis in Greece, uh, so far unsuccessfully. Uh, she would have been the journalistic voice in our panel. She, she covered the, the fires in Greece this summer. Um, if we cannot reach her, then uh, that's too bad, but we have three wonderful panelists and a last one to share her insights and thoughts. Anne Falkenhut from Groningen is a psychologist who also works on the question of adaptation on a more individual motivational basis, if I'm correct. Anne, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clemens. And also thank you for uh, inviting me to come here and to share my uh, story and my research with you. So I'll just go ahead and open up my slides now. So I think the story that uh, Deborah was already saying really connects to what I wanted to say. So it's maybe great that we're in the same in this order at the moment, and I will explain what I mean later. So to start, I wanted to share also my thoughts about the IPCC report and also what we've been seeing happening in Europe, because of course the two are very much connected. So to start with, one of the things in the IPCC report that really jumped out at me was this statement saying that global surface temperatures will continue to increase until at least the mid-century under all emission scenarios considered. So at this point, climate change is inevitable, at least to some extent. And this, of course, really brings home this message that climate change necessitates societal change. And not only do we need to put in all of our effort to mitigate climate change as, as much as we can, but also we need to start indeed, as uh, Deborah was saying, we need to put effort into adapting to climate change because the IPCC report is already showing that at least some level of climate change is inevitable. So if you look at these photos of these events occurring in Europe, um, you see that it's also already affecting people right here, right now at this very moment. So these are the impacts of climate change and we can expect more and more of these kinds of impacts to occur. But what I also see when I look at these pictures is that these people, indeed, there's no policies in place for them at this moment. And it will also likely take a long time for these kinds of adaptation policies to be implemented by governments. So I also see a need for people to start adapting themselves already now. If they cannot wait until governmental policies are put into place to protect them, they also need to take measures themselves to adapt to climate change. So climate change also necessitates behavioral change. And as a psychologist who studies people's behavior, this is of course uh, of key interest to me. So fortunately, there are actually a lot of things that individuals and households can do to some extent limit the impacts of climate related risks on their on their well being and on their households. Of course, policy is very important and at scale, of course, more effective at reducing climate change impacts, but the things that individuals and households can do shouldn't be understated. But then another thing that really jumped out at me from the summary for policymakers from the IPCC report is indeed also something that was already mentioned uh, by Diana, namely the fact that every region is experiencing concurrent and multiple changes in climate impact drivers, meaning that people aren't just facing one risk and having to adapt to one risk, but people will actually be, fo be faced with multiple climate change risks at the same time. And this is, I feel, an issue that is at this moment, uh, not really on in people's awareness. 
So just to illustrate, uh, in my own country, the Netherlands, people will be not only facing more cases of very extreme rainfall, but also cases of pluvial flooding, as we've seen this summer. Also, there will be more heat waves, more drought, and also more vector-borne diseases, such as diseases transmitted by ticks, such as Lyme disease. And these are just some examples. Uh, there's also more examples that I didn't include in this slide. But the point here is that people are facing multiple risks at the same time. So people will also need to engage in a wide repertoire of adaptation behaviors in order to effectively cope with all of these different risks. So taken together, we're looking at uh, it's, it's going to be a pretty demanding what we're going to have to ask from people um, if we want them to adapt effectively through their own actions and their own responses, because people are facing many different risks at the same time. And in order to adapt to these risks, people will also have to engage in a set of behaviors. So a key question that we're asking ourselves and also policymakers are very interested in is how we can motivate people to engage in such a wide variety of adaptation behaviors. Because changing one behavior is already quite difficult, but having people engage in a set of behaviors or a variety of different behaviors is even more challenging. So on the one hand, um, we want people to engage with the overarching story of climate change, because ultimately climate change is the thing causing all of those different risks and the reason why people need to engage in a variety of different new behaviors. So it makes sense that if you get people to engage with the story of climate change, they become more aware, they start to see the risks in their own lives of climate change, they will be more inclined to adapt. So this story is supported to some extent in the literature. So studies, there are studies showing that the more people think climate change is real, the more they worry about climate change, the more they think climate change will have negative impacts, the more people are supportive of adaptation policies, the more they report intentions to adapt, and they are also more likely to look up information, maybe about climate change, maybe about adapting locally, or maybe about the risks that people are facing in their locale. But this is not the whole story, because also as a paper by Deborah actually shows, um, believing in climate change is sometimes not enough to motivate people to also actually implement physical measures in and around the house to reduce the impacts of climate change. So in this paper, um, they didn't find any effects of whether people believed in climate change or not on whether people had implemented measures to reduce the vulnerability of their homes to coastal climate change risks such as sea level rise or hurricanes. So that paper really clearly demonstrates that just believing in climate change and just being worried about it or engaged with the story isn't sufficient to motivate behavior. So the, the next question you might have is, okay, well, how can we then in that case do motivate people to adapt? In my own work, I see that the, um, the concept of efficacy comes up a lot and efficacy falls apart into two different types of efficacy. Self-efficacy is all about people perceiving that they are able and capable of implementing adaptive measures. Whereas outcome efficacy is all about the way people perceive adaptive measures. So do they think it's effective? Do they think that those measures will actually protect them? And we find that the more people think they are, they are capable of implementing measures and the more people perceive measures as effective, the more they are actually motivated to implement those measures. But the, be, the challenge with this from a behavioral change perspective is the fact that self-efficacy and outcome efficacy can of course vary from behavior to behavior and per, from person to person. And since we need people to engage in a lot of different kinds of behaviors, we might need to address people's perceived self and outcome efficacy for each of those separate behaviors, which is of course quite challenging from a behavioral change perspective. So just to round off, I've um, shown you how climate change really necessitates behavioral change and people can and need to engage in a wide repertoire of adaptation behaviors. And if we want to change people's behavior to make sure that they also are engaging in those behaviors, not only do we need them to focus on the global picture of climate change, but also we need to consider that there can be very specific barriers related to behavior um, and efficacy can play a key role here. All right, that's it for me. Back uh, to you, Clemens. Thank you so much, Anne. And, and Deborah, was it lovely that she quoted a, a paper that you co-authored? So that's always lovely when the panelists come together intellectually. Thank you Amy so will, much. Amy, it will be in the mail. 
<laughs> Excellent. Um, dear audience, um, we have plenty of time for questions and comments. So please make use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And then I will you know, direct the questions to our distinguished panelists. No news from Daphne Tollis yet. We might have lost her. There might be a connection problem. We talked a lot about adaptation. So we adapt this panel a little bit. And maybe I can start with a question that I would direct to Diana, if I may. Diana, um, are there reasons to hope? So I, I was involved in a project where they talked about children growing up right now into a dying planet and how hard it is for children and stressful to realize, well, the planet may be lost. And when Deborah talked about the new normal and, and looking at the pictures that Anne showed, you know, floods and fires, and if this is the new normal, uh, can you give us reasons to hope that seem to be realistic because radical change, most people are not prepared for that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. First of all, the planet will not be lost. The planet will be even happier without us. But uh, that's, uh, of course, a joke. Well, unfortunately, it's serious. But there is absolutely no reason for despair. It is important to be aware of these risks, which are very real, that what we experienced over the summer is going to be the new normal in a couple of decades. Uh, and, and we definitely will see more of these over the coming decades. But as the previous speakers already very eloquently expressed, actually, there is a lot that we can still adapt to. And the big um, shift is, for example, between one and a half degrees and two degrees centigrade climate change. So if we do manage to stop warming at one and a half degrees, which is one and a half degrees centigrade warmer than pre-industrial levels, then we can still fairly comfortably state that we can adapt to most of the changes still. At two degrees, it's getting much worse and definitely there are tipping points and there are uh, changes that will happen between one and a half to two degrees to which already we cannot adapt to, but still the, there is to the majority we can adapt to. But above two degrees, definitely we are going to have such cascades that, um, that there is more and more where we are going to face the limitations of adaptation in more and more areas. And in that regard, with more information on that, you should watch out for our report, uh, the second volume of our sixth assessment report, which is on impacts and adaptation, which is going to come out in February. But uh, definitely the point is that we are not yet at all at the point of despair, but it's very important that we're all aware of the really significant risks. And that's why we cannot delay action at all now, because what, um, just one more point, because, uh, uh, because Anna has been excellent in bringing out a couple of really key messages from this report. To me, the most important uh, key message was that whatever temperature we want to stabilize climate change at, we still have to get to net zero carbon dioxide emissions. So if we don't get to net mm -hmm. zero carbon dioxide emissions, we cannot stabilize at all. So that's um, so we, we so that what that means is that the, the actions what we do in the next decade or two decades will determine which temperature we can stabilize at. So action now is really important. Thank you, Diana. That was encouraging. The first questions are trickling in. Uh, please, dear audience, feel free to make use of the Q&A button. I have a question for Anne, if I may, uh, that just came in. Could you please give some examples of what the personal adaptations would be, like moving your home away from the coast or not eating meat, question mark? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, actually, uh, I already saw the question in the Q&A box, so I quickly pulled up uh, um, uh, a figure from one of my uh, papers that we did for the Global Centre on Adaptation, which is an organization uh, here in Europe um, that has been trying to really also put adaptation on political agenda. And here for that report, we also came up with this kind of classification of how people can adapt to climate change. And we came up with these six different categories. So the first category is information seeking. There's also ensuring there's preparation. So making sure uh, you have all sorts of things in your house that you can use if there is an event ongoing. Of course, political action is really important in this case um, because adaptation is like we said, also very much dependent on what governments are doing and what policies are being implemented. So the voice of individual citizens can also make an important difference there. Uh, then there's protection. So taking measures also in and around your house to really kind of keep out the risk 
Uh, so imagine uh, installing hurricane shutters in the front of your windows. Um, and then there's also, um, as, you, as the, the person also mentioned in the question itself, evacuating or migrating away from areas in order to avoid being exposed to the risk. Um, so this is kind of a crude categorization we came up with to just also illustrate and show what adaptation at the individual and household level can look like. We're also working on further um, expanding this uh, categorization. Also, um, a colleague of ours who's at um, Yale University, Jennifer Carmen, she also did some work on this and she also came up with a great categorization that had um, that mostly overlapped with the work that we already did, but she also had some additional categories. Um, um, that, and that really illustrates also um, the richness of the amount of things that people can do and the diversity of the kind of actions that people can engage in but also must engage in. Great. Thank you, Anne. Um, could you please unshare this? Excellent. Yeah, Pretty absolutely. impressive how you pulled it up, by the way. Um, <laughs> We, we have a question, uh, actually two questions that are more on the political side. So I will ask Deborah to be our expert here. Um, our, our friendly librarian, Aiden Clemens asked the question, we see the huge impact of immigrants and asylum seekers in Europe now. How to prepare for the inevitable refugees and displaced people? So the whole climate refugee question, Deborah, any, any wisdom on that? I think we need to be having conversations about it to begin with. Um, the conversations about adaptation often are about the damaged locations, the places that have just experienced the hardship and the conversations seem almost exclusively centered around rebuilding or like, you know, what do we do to restore these areas? But, um, you know, we need to ask hard questions like in the United States, how many more times would we rebuild New Orleans? I love Louisiana. So I just, I like it and I have family there. So I, I say that I pick a place that I love because I know how hard it is for people who have place attachment to have that kind of difficult conversation. The conversation that we are not having, which is the one that's in the, the, the Q and A over there is where would people go? What, what are good places to invest resources? Because even though every place will experience some climate impacts, some places, would be better um, than others. Uh, for example, South Bend, Indiana, where we are uh, hosting this webinar, um, you know, we are uh, we have uh, our impacts. We get the occasional tornado. Um, we have had flooding. We've had in 2012. We had droughts. But by and large, living in South Bend, Indiana, from a climate perspective, is not the same as living in Miami or uh, or New Orleans, right? And uh, Europe. I'm not a specialist on the demography of Europe, but I have to believe that there are people. There are specialists out there who would say that uh, in a climate changed world at 1.5 degrees or at two degrees, these locations may be a better place to invest our communal resources. And I think we have to be thinking like, like that. We have to be thinking planetary. We have to be thinking about humanity as a species. And if we're going to invest resources, um, uh, should it be in that, the, um, I'm forgetting the name of the beautiful island in Greece that got destroyed by fires. I can imagine how heartbreaking it is. Um, I know that there was, uh, I watched some video of um, a European uh, uh, vineyard uh, uh, in Germany somewhere where they were famous for their wines and everybody was heartbroken, um, but that's the time to have the, the really hard discussions of if we invest here and we rebuild, or is this just a patch on a problem because this area is super vulnerable. Um, and in fact, so we're just buying our time and in 10 years, we may be doing the same thing and investing these same resources over and over again, or is there a better strategy? And again, because I'm not a specialist on Europe, I hesitate to say that I'm the one who knows what that strategy should be. Um, but, but I know that the conversations aren't happening among the, the very people who are the most informed about that region. Great, Th thank you, Deborah. I got a question that's not through the Q and A, but through the chat. And the question is, uh, maybe a question for Diana or whoever has wisdom on that. What would you consider the most vulnerable region in Europe or the most vulnerable regions in Europe? And mention the Mediterranean and, and uh, any other takers on this question? Well, definitely the Mediterranean. Uh, as I mentioned already, the uh, precipitation 
the precipitation will significantly decrease. I haven't shown the other uh, figure, which is also in the SPM of the Working Group Final Report, which shows that also one of the worst affected in the world will be uh, the Mediterranean, where soil moisture is going to significantly decrease. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I believe the entire coastline, since we mm -hmm. have a lot of our infrastructure in the coastline, Venice, for example, uh, and, and a lot, uh, uh, or, or London. And uh, when you're talking about um, uh, by the end of the century, it could be in the best case 50 centimeters uh, sea level rise, but it could be one and a half meters. That's also what uh, the report shows. So with that kind of, um, with that kind of sea level rise, who is going to... Um, what's going to happen to all that wealth. Basically, most of the wealth of Europe is, uh, uh, is next to either shorelines, uh, ocean shorelines or uh, sea shorelines, but also fluvial shorelines. So uh, that's, um, these are, I think, what we really have to look at. And what, in the, what um, Deborah said was, was very important, but the difficulty in Europe is that, yes, Scandinavia will be much more attractive, and, and that's where uh, probably the, um, more of the positive impacts of climate change will happen, at least for a while, because after a while, everybody will lose, but for a while. On the other hand, uh, I don't think anyone in Scandinavia will be very happy to kind of just say, okay, come Mediterranean countries, just come here, because also there are significant uh, uh, wealth differences in these countries. Mm -hmm. So altogether, it's, it's very difficult and very challenging in Europe to tr uh, try to look at uh, as a whole. It's true that perhaps Central Europe is so far, which is kind of the safest, Deborah mentioned uh, some areas in the US, also for example, Hungary and Central Europe. Yes, we also do, did have our first major tornado and so on, but in general, it's heat waves, which would be um, the only really major impact that we are having so far. Thank you, Diana. Uh, what we can do now before we move to the next questions is we can show a one minute video that Daphne Tollis took of the fire on, in Lesbos and the refugee camp. If it works technically, our colleague Grant will show it. Thank you. Um, it's, it's just one reminder that we are dealing with real people, especially vulnerable people in, in vulnerable situations, which brings me to a question that I would like to address to Anne. And the question is, what explains why many educated and apparently climate aware people continue flying around for short vacations and riding SUVs despite the clear negative impact of these activities and decisions on climate? What level of change slash action is needed to make a change on this front? And Yes, thank you. That's a, a great question. I actually have a colleague who does the, this kind of work on specifically specifically flight shame. So whether people feel embarrassed or not uh, because of the impacts associated with uh, flying. Um, 
I find this quite a quite a difficult question because there's so many different kinds of um, factors that we could discuss that go into this decision. So first and foremost, I mean, as a psychologist, you want to look at individual factors, right? So you could say, oh, people just simply don't care about climate change or people are not necessarily uh, interested in it. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that's necessarily the case, because if you look at polls, uh, international polls or European polls, people in Europe generally uh, acknowledge overall the, the reality of climate change. Most people are very concerned about it. So I don't necessarily think that that's necessarily where the issue is at. Rather, I think a lot of people are actually quite motivated to do something to change their behavior. It's just that flying is one of those behaviors that is quite difficult to replace with an alternative because it's so convenient, it's relatively inexpensive. And um, here you can also see how policies can intersect with individual behavior. So had, for example, the European Union more ex extensively invested in uh, a reliable railway system across all borders, so that would make it easier to replace your flights by train, but rather we see a system where flying is heavily subsidized, whereas we don't necessarily see that same kind of development yet for taking the uh, taking the train if you want to travel around Europe. So the more barriers there will there are between um, you know your your abstract kind of goal of oh, I want to be an environmental person and the concrete decision that you have to make. Um, that, that really makes a big difference. So it's, it's almost an infrastructural problem, I would say at this moment. And one of the key things that we should also take into account is that people also have a lot of different goals in life that they are striving for. So you, even though you can be a very environmental person, you find the environment very important, you also have other things you want to do in life. For example, people value their health, their family, uh, they want to travel, they want to, exp they want to have Th those kinds of travel experiences so all the time people are kind of juggling all of these goals at the same time and if you have to trade between you, you know if you value your family a lot it makes sense that you will get on that plane even though you are in you or you want to be a very environmental person so people are constantly kind of balancing and juggling these different kinds of values and goals they have in life and if there are just a lot of barriers to reaching a particular goal. So in the case of flying, there's just a lot of barriers to you replacing your flight. Yeah. Um, it's quite likely that that's the one of the kind of behavior that people find difficult to give up. Whereas if you facilitate behaviors as much as possible, it will become much more easier to make the transition. The same with uh, driving an electric vehicle. If there's no uh, charging station near your house or even in your neighborhood, uh, it will become quite a high barrier yeah, for you to mm -hmm. uptake that behavior, even though you might find it very important and you really want to drive the electric vehicle. But, you know, if the infrastructure around you starts to change and you see more and more of these charging stations popping up, then the, these barriers are considerably lowered and more and more people might be uh, willing to take up uh, these Thank kinds you, of behaviors. Anne. Thank you, Anne. So a point about infrastructure. Um, let's move to a political question. And the question is, uh, maybe for, for Deborah, um, with politicians often bound to their cons constituents and concerned about elections, it is often difficult to communicate to local communities the need to adapt and not to rebuild in places destroyed as the result of climate change. I'm specifically thinking of Southwest Germany's flooding this summer and the repeated desires of locals to rebuild in the same place. How can politicians bridge this divide between what locals want versus what is necessary for adaptation? And how can people be motivated to change? So the, the, the political question, Deborah, what, what do you think? How can politicians bridge the divide between what locals want versus what is necessary for adaptation? I think it's, a, it's an excellent question because the truth is that the politician risks not getting reelected. It's, it's just um, politicians... Um, uh, they do very well in disasters when they come in and save the day. They, um, uh, lots of studies show that they don't get credit for being prepared. I mean, and that's on us, that's on us as constituents. 
Um, we, if we have a very responsible politician who takes these IPCC reports seriously and does everything that they can to encourage mitigation and adaptation, and then a disaster does not come, <laughs> the public fails to appreciate that those efforts were still yes. very valuable. They yes. were important. They were good things to do. And we just lucked out that our particular locale did not get hit by disaster. So a savvy politician knowing this, it's, it's a hard thing for somebody to do. It involves real leadership skills uh, to be able to do the right thing and also get reelected. And so I feel for people who are in that position, um, I know how hard it is to run for office um, and how you know to, to be able to withstand that kind of scrutiny for doing the right thing. Um, so uh, how to do it, um, some of this involves um, quasi public private things like insurance, right? I mean, um, how many more times will we insure these properties if they get rebuilt? If the world of insurance would uh, send signals as they are starting to do, I know in the United States, again, I'm not a specialist in Europe to know uh, what is happening in the insurance industries there, um, but there are, uh, there are whole communities now where the insurance companies are saying, you know what, we can't, we, we, it's not acceptable risk. And that should be sending strong signals to people that you know you're on your own i mean you know if, uh -huh. if you can if you can accept that risk then it's on you but very few people do that In interestingly once the catastrophe hits then everyone conservative liberal doesn't matter your politics everyone thinks that they ought to be reimbursed <laughs> some yeah. for some reason yeah. we think that well it's my home now somebody should come to the rescue That's the united states parallels would be we think fema should come in and never mind that fema is nearly bankrupt how many more times can fema be taxed mm -hmm. um, we we don't acknowledge our own failure to have bought flood insurance when somebody told us we should have bought flood insurance um, and all of those are problematic and with good political leadership uh, those should be the subject of, uh, of uh, these kinds of webinars, but also like the media should be talking about mm -hmm. who's insured and go on record now. If you want to rebuild in your flood prone area, are you willing personally to take that risk? Because, you know, you've you've made a choice and we're, you know, we meaning the scientific community, the IPCC, but uh, hopefully local politicians are telling you this is a high risk location. We understand that you want to do this, but then you cannot come back later and ask for the handout. Um, I don't know if we're brave enough to do that. And I, I guess I should say that in that case, the, the my, my discussion has just been about reasonably affluent people. We do mm -hmm. have to acknowledge that there are impoverished communities living in um, uh, in coastal regions uh, who don't have that flexibility to move. And in yeah. that case, we then really exactly. do need these uh, government assistance programs to allow people at certain uh, income brackets um, to be able to afford to move to other locations. Thank you, Deborah. Let's stay in the realm of politics and before we move back to psychology, a question for Diana. Uh, do you think national legislations are to be harmonized with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and Paris Agreement rules in order to implement mitigation action and in which mode should it happen? Yes, thank you very much. Absolutely. I mean, uh, basically all countries, uh, with just very few exceptions, who are parties to the Paris Agreement have already ratified the Paris Agreement. So in one way, this is already in their legislation. Uh, furthermore, uh, the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement doesn't specify how uh, these countries have to meet their, uh, their commitments. And in fact, they are quite free to make uh, different commitments. Simply, there is a lot of pressure now on countries mm -hmm. to, um, to increase their ambition uh, until uh, the conference of the parties this year in Glasgow. So, um, uh, but in, in a way, um, there are, we are quite free in how do we do it, but we have to, uh, to get it. Uh, one way, and that perhaps answers the, uh, the, uh, the other question as well, which is really uh, promising. I'm, I'm right now actually in Berlin uh, and at a Next Zero um, conference, and it was very interesting. We had a session on how recently uh, different uh, court cases have been actually sometimes even more um, uh, helpful in this than, uh, than the UNFCC. Of course, the UNFCC process is extremely important, but somehow the diplomatic, uh, the global diplomatic um, dialogue is moving a bit slow. Well, of course, uh, there are many, many, many difficulties, but it seems that perhaps the courts will be able to force some uh, of the, uh, the issues or, or actually take the role of some uh, of the UNFCC processes uh, in, in some cases. So that's another uh, pathway uh -huh. now to force countries. 
Thank you, Diana. So, and be prepared for three questions that I put together under, you know, the big heading psychology. I mean, you represent psychology here. Apologies for that. Um, so the first question is uh, from our dear friend, Fritz Heinzen. How should people deal with the multiplicity of crises? There are so many climate disasters, pandemics, wars, terrorists, and economic downturns. Uh, should they focus on one or two, three or four, or all of them? And how should they prioritize? So that's the first question. How should people prioritize looking at all these dark places and, and crises? The second question is, recent research shows that only 100 fossil fuel companies are responsible for 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions shifting the focus from individual action to corporate accountability when it comes to curbing emissions. How can individuals join in on holding these companies accountable? That's also a question for Deborah, I realize, but you know, the individual's agency here. And the third question from uh, my dear student, uh, Shasad, I consider myself very helpless regarding my part because although I can try to apply the no plastic policy, but it does not seem to have any effect on the environment and people around me do not care about it. What is your take on how to make it more holistic and public? And, and then I would ask Deborah also to chime in. Thank you, and please. Okay, thank you. These are quite uh, existential questions, I would say, especially yeah. the first one. Um, so I will try to address them briefly so we can also uh, still have the other speakers also maybe comment on this. So the first question, addressing the multiplicity of the problems. So this is specifically what also I was trying to communicate when I, I gave my little opening remarks my, my, uh, when I showed you the slides. Um, I indeed believe that um, there, there, there is a multiplicity of problems, but this is also the way that we should be approaching it rather than having people then going to people and telling them, okay, we'll be facing more floods and you'll be facing more heat waves and you'll be facing more drought and presenting them as kind of individual problems people are, have to cope with. I think it's more strategic to say, okay, there's actually this one big problem we are facing, namely climate change. And when you want people to kind of be able to connect all of those ongoing events um, to an overarching story because I think that helps people to process everything that's going on more and make more sense of it. We've mm -hmm. also seen with the video that you showed how all of these uh, also economical and societal problems are kind of coming together also in the climate problem. So what, we, what we've seen with the refugee crisis is of course uh, it made it so much worse also by climatic change and also exaggerated by, by climate change. So all of the problems are also related and connected to each other, uh, which also makes a climate crisis, of course, kind of uh, on the one hand overwhelming, but at the same time, it also offers a perspective because if we address the climate crisis holistically, we can address a lot of different problems at the same time. So I would also see it as, um, actually offering uh, some perspective in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so the second question is about how there's 70% of emissions are caused by the hundreds of the same companies. Of course, uh, when I talk about the individual, often people will, will ask me this kind of question saying, okay, you talk about the individual all the time, but it's actually the companies that are responsible. Um, yes, uh, of course, I present a bit of a limited perspective by saying individuals need to do things and I, I don't go into all of the details, namely that individuals are, of course, situated in a social and an economical system that, of course, also determines and limits what they can and can do. Uh -huh. um, and of course, policy and of course, what companies are doing are also very important to solving the climate crisis. Um, so I don't want to uh, kind of understate the importance uh, or overstate the importance of the individual. But mm -hmm. then again, at the same time, I do think individual change can be really important because those 100 companies also produce services and products that all of us are using. So that, of course, connects us to those companies uh, in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, if we want to hold companies accountable, I think, uh, again, this may might offer some perspective and also agency because there's a lot that, again, people can do. So... Um, um, for example, in the Netherlands, we've seen recently a lot of employees of government agencies have been really trying to make sure that 
pension fund managers are not investing their pensions in fossil fuels. And I mm -hmm. thought this was such a great example of how individual um, government uh, workers were saying, okay, we don't want them to invest our money in these projects anymore. So I think investing your money in in projects that you stand behind and making sure other people aren't investing your money in, in those kinds of projects is, I think, also a really important step. Impressive. So it can be as simple as not buying products of companies you don't support, but also making sure you're investing your money in things that you do stand behind and making sure that uh, your pension or uh, other kinds of uh, stocks you might have uh, are contributing to a cause that is important. Thank you, um, Anne. And the yeah. last question was about the perceived helplessness of the individual. Yeah, so I what I was trying to do in the in my last two answers was trying already to give you some agency, and give you some perspective on the way in which you can uh, change, um, you know, you can contribute Excellent. to uh, this problem. Because as, well, as, as I also mentioned in my talk, uh, we find that efficacy is indeed one of the key factors kind of motivating whether people engage in behavior or not. And I think that the, the question uh, or the comments that this person has written really uh, kind of exemplifies a lack of efficacy. So they feel hopeless. They, they feel like they're not able to do anything. And at the same time, they also feel like their behavior isn't effective. Um, so I feel like this comment kind of demonstrates what I mean when I talk about efficacy. So Excellent. changing your, your viewpoint, um, I, I would always so like to say that um, one of the things we see in our own research is that social factors are really important in changing people's behavior. So if everyone around you suddenly starts acting green or is acting more sustainably and you're, you're talking to people about it, that can also be a key trigger for people to start reflecting on their own behavior and try to change their behavior. So uh, if other people are influencing you, it also implies that you have the capability of influencing I others think, around Anna, you. Thank you. And, and you shouldn't underestimate how many people you know and how many people you come into contact with every day so definitely keep talking to other people about that you uh, and tell them you find this really important show them what you're doing but also make sure that there you you demonstrate kind of this efficacy yourself showing that there are things thank you, you and others sorry to oh. cut you short yes yeah, sorry you. the <laughs> message for shasa is you know if you give us an example we will learn from you we have about exactly. two minutes left. Deborah, any comments on the questions that Anne just discussed briefly? Yes, I'll try to give them very short. On the question of rank ordering, uh, or like, you know, you have this multiplicity of, of crises. Um, there's a political scientist named David Orr, and he famously said, um, no matter your cause, it's a lost cause on a dying planet. And so I guess for me, as somebody, I'm, I'm a very political person and I have lots of things that interest me, but I do put climate change as number one. Um, I mean, we can't address all these other challenges in the, in the world without addressing climate change. Um, on the issue of, of um, uh, individual efforts, I guess I would say that um, people have a choice of how to invest their individual time. Mm -hmm. And I think investing in individual political action at this point, uh, getting the right people elected is probably the best use of your, you know, that's the best green behavior yeah. you could possibly have, right? Because it is the case that individual action that, you know, may, you change your light bulbs, you drive the right kind of vehicle, but it's not the same as systemic changes. The systemic changes that we need will come from leadership. It will come from Thank change <laughs> in, in the people in office. And so um, for young people who may be listening to this in particular, it is not just a matter of voting for the right people, but running for office. And we are seeing younger and younger people uh, just saying, you know what, I don't need to like wait it out, wait my turn. There's there's no time, right? We, we've learned from Diana's first report that, that uh, you know, it is, um, what did the UN General Secretary say? It's um, code red for humanity, right? And and the, the alarm bells are deafening. And if that's the case, if we're taking the science seriously, then if you are somebody with good ideas and, and think that you can, you aspire to a leadership position, do it now. Do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. We are almost at time. Maybe one sentence per panelist to close us off. Diana, what would be your one sentence that you would give us on our way? Um, the situation is very challenging, but we action now can prevent most of the difficult situations still. Thank you, Diana. And what would be your one sentence for us to move on in our journey? 
Uh, my sentence would be connect with the overarching story, but also think about your efficacy. Don't get bogged down in these feelings of helplessness, because there is a lot that you can do as we try to show you today. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Deborah, what would be your sentence? Listen to Diana and Anne. <laughs> and read <laughs> Deborah's paper that was shown by Anne. Thank you so much. We are on time. I apologize to our uh, audience who still had questions. Uh, we want to respect our panelists' schedules and our own schedules. Thank you so much, Diana, Anne, and Deborah, for your really uh, wonderful contributions and the lively panel, the food for thought and the encouragement for action. As you know, uh, this has been a virtual event, so we owe a lot of gratitude to those who made this possible. Our tech team, uh, Tim, uh, Jack Lee, Grant Osborne, Mel Webb, and Jen Lektansky. Thank you so much for uh, having made this possible. Thank you to our audience. And uh, the Nanovic Institute will continue with um, flash panels and panels next week on Thursday at 5 p.m. here in Notre Dame. We have the Nanovic Forum with Miroslav Marinovic, a Gulag survivor, who will talk about faith in communist and post-communist countries. Stay tuned. Thank you so much again, Diana and, and um, Deborah. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and evening, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye now, and thank you very much.